tomorrow, uh, but not in the office. Yeah, we're doing a lot of work from home with the. Uh, so how is it going on? Is it 50% attendance or it is full attendance in office? Uh, it's about 50%. Uh, 50%. For the most part, those who are doing laboratory experiments, you know, those of us who work in an office are working at home so that those who can work in need to work in a lab can be in the lab. So that's how we're doing it. Good morning to all of you. We'll start our program now. Dear participants, invited speakers, and colleagues, a very good morning to all. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all on the last and fifth day of ESSEC 2020. We'll start our program with the last technical session of the symposium and we'll have panel discussion at 14.30 hours Indian Standard Time, followed by a valedictory function and concluding remarks. Before I go to the program, I request all the participants to switch off their cameras. Thank you. Let's go to the last technical session of eSuspect 2020. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce you to our session chair, Professor V. K. Manchanda. Professor V. K. Manchanda has about 1100 publications in the area of separation, complex chemistry, and novel materials as radiation sensors. He has appeared recently in the list of top two person scientists published by Stanford University in 2020. As PhD IFL guide of University of Mumbai, HBNI, Homingaba National Institute, Mumbai, and SKKU South Korea, he has guided 20 students. He was responsible for initiated BLNS Supposed Symposium for series on separation science and technology in 2004. And he's the founder president of Indian Association of Separation Scientists and Technologists, SF. He worked as head of radiochemistry BRC from 2003 to 2011. He was invited to join Department of Energy Science, SKKU, in South Korea as WCU professor from 2011 to 2014. He was awarded Fulbright's Fellowship to pursue postdoctoral studies in UTE to Texas. He is the recipient of M. V. Ramanya Memorial Outstanding Radio Chemistry Award for 2017. Now I kindly request Dr. V. K. Manchanda to chair the session. Manchandaji, you are on mute. Thank you, Nitika. It is my privilege to introduce the speaker of uh, this uh, special lecture, Dr. David L. Clark. He is the Program Director, National Security Education Center and Plutonium Science Strategy Leader for Los Alamos. He is Area of research are uh, electronic structure and bonding of actinide materials, application of synchrotron radiations to actinide size, behavior of actinides in the environment, and in the aging effects of nuclear weapon material. He is the recipient of several prestigious awards, which include Glenn Seberg Award in Nuclear Chemistry 2017, ACS, Fellow American Association for the Advancement of Science, Fellow Los Alamos National Laboratory. He has published several uh, peer reviewed uh, publications he has to his credit with the uh, citations of about 1000 and H index 54. But I will say, above all, he is a very close dear friend of SESTEC. He has been attending SESTEX regularly for more than a decade now. And uh, he has been inspiring the young researcher. In fact, that is his passion, that science education and interacting with the youngsters it is his passion. I vividly remember that uh, during poster session, he always used to be most popular uh, judge and uh, we are, we'll be, we are very privileged 
that he agreed to talk to us on a very interesting topic. And uh, with these words, may I request Dr. Clark to start his special lecture? Yes, uh, thank you, Professor Manchanda uh, and the organizing committee for the invitation to uh, join SESTEC in this unusual format uh, that we're doing. Uh, I miss being there in person and seeing my friends and uh, enjoying the food. Uh, I'll ask uh, the session chair to uh, please give me the um, ability to share my slides. I'll need the, the ball. I'll need to become the presenter. Maybe I can just, yeah, someone will have to give that to me. There we go. Very good. Thank you. So, uh, I will go ahead and start sharing uh, the presentation here. And hopefully you can all see that uh, just fine. Um, on sort of short notice, and uh, I decided to give this presentation, which is a more applied story of, uh, of something that I'm very proud of. And uh, I have this title, Plutonium Chemistry in the Battlefields of the Cold War. And it's really the story of environmental cleanup of a very large and contaminated US nuclear weapons production site. Um, but the story starts really with the Manhattan Project and the challenges that uh, people had at the time. In 1941, when Glenn Seaborg uh, discovered plutonium, they had only discovered a few atoms and they had three main challenges in front of them. The first was to find a method for the production on a large scale. The second was to determine the chemical properties of plutonium in order to devise a method for chemical separation and purification. And the third was to scale that up from micrograms to kilograms, uh, really a pretty daunting challenge. Now, the first problem of a scale up was uh, solved by Enrico Fermi when he discovered the nuclear chain reaction on December 2nd, 1942. The second and third problems came down to determining the chemical properties of plutonium well enough uh, to do the uh, scale up and separation. Now, uh, I'm sure that this is familiar to most of you, but this is uh, for, the, for the students. Uh, how we produce plutonium uh, in a reactor. Of course, Fermi's chain reaction demonstrated that one could produce neutrons. And in a reactor, uh, a fertile element like uranium-238 can capture neutrons to form 239, which has a short half-life and decays by beta emission to neptunium-239 and then another uh, beta decay to plutonium-239, which now has a half-life of 24,000 years and uh, is really the, uh, the primary isotope of plutonium uh, that people work with. Now, the longer it sits in the reactor, one can generate uh, additional uh, heavier elements, uh, heavier isotopes of plutonium-240, 241, and so on. And of course, the 241 plutonium then decays to americium. So usually, in environmental situations, these are the isotopes uh, that we're confronted with. Now, in 1943, uh, they decided to build these plutonium production reactors in the state of Washington on the Columbia River in what is, uh, became known as the Hanford site. And what really is remarkable to me was that they started construction in 1943 and they had uh, they came online in September of 1944, and I'm sure that it's the same in India as it is in the U.S. and many other countries. That today, uh, starting up a new nuclear reactor from scratch in uh, that short time frame is pretty much uh, unheard of. Now, the original separation of plutonium was done using the bismuth phosphate process. And what was amazing uh, about this was that in 1942, the first separated quantities of plutonium were 2.77 micrograms. And by 1944, they had figured out how to scale this up to kilogram quantities. So this is a scale up factor of 10 to the 9 or 1 billion. Uh, I think this is one of the great um, technological achievements of the 20th century, actually, to be able to do that. 
Now, uh, in irradiating the fuel, the content is about 300 parts per million of plutonium. Uh, and uh, that had to be separated from all the fission products and, uh, and other things in there. And this on the right hand side is the bismuth phosphate uh, process. Uh, the reason it was chosen was because bismuth phosphate is crystalline. And so you could separate it with centrifugation. So with 300 parts per million of plutonium, you can't just precipitate the plutonium, but you have to use a carrier or a co-precipitation process. And so bismuth phosphate was chosen and the bismuth phosphate would precipitate and carry the low oxidation state, plutonium-4, into the precipitate. And many of the fission products and the uranium uh, would stay in the liquid state and that you would stabilize uranium uh, in sulfuric acid, as I'm sure uh, you all know. And I wanna point out this high level waste uh, throughout, you generate a lot of waste in this process. So then you could reoxidize plutonium to the higher oxidation state and then reprecipitate bismuth phosphate and carry those same fission products down. And then you could reduce the plutonium and do this again. And so you see this, this done uh, over and over to decontaminate. You could then concentrate with a different precipitation, uh, a co-precipitant, lanthanum fluoride, and ultimately isolate your plutonium uh, with pure hydrogen uh, peroxide. Now, this process generated huge quantities of waste, uh, which still plague us in the United States uh, today. Now, after the Manhattan Project in the 1950s during the Cold War, uh, the Purex process came along and that was a real game changer. That was a liquid-liquid extraction uh, this is used uh, everywhere throughout the world, and uh, there are many in the audience who are uh, far uh, better experts than I at this. But this is a liquid-liquid extraction process using tributyl phosphate, uh, this ligand here, which will coordinate to both uranium and plutonium, these neutral complexes. And in a remarkable uh, biphasic extraction, uh, you could separate the uranium and plutonium from the fission products lanthanides, uh, trivalent actinides, etc. And then uh, with a reducing agent, you could separate, you could reduce the plutonium to the, to the lower oxidation state and back extract that as a way to separate the plutonium from the uranium. And this is done uh, all over the world uh, and has been used to generate, you know, huge quantities of, of uh, plutonium uh, in many countries. So then in the United States, uh, up to about the late 1980s, we had this huge uh, industrial complex that, that spanned the entire uh, U.S., a combination of uh, mining sites where uranium was mined, uh, enrichment sites uh, where uranium was turned into the hexafluoride and enriched, uh, turned into fuel, irradiated in reactors uh, to create the plutonium, and then uh, that plutonium went to various different sites. Here we have Los Alamos in New Mexico, Lawrence Livermore, uh, Sandia also in New Mexico uh, that were involved in sort of the weapons design. Uh, and then things were manufactured here in Colorado at the Rocky Flats site. And so I wanna take you there to the Rocky Flats site to talk about how that has changed uh, over time. So for four decades in the United States, uh, this Rocky Flats plant produced the plutonium uh, cores or pits for the US nuclear weapons. It was located uh, just outside of Denver, Colorado, uh, 16 miles. This is a view down in the lower right here, looking across the plant, you could see the tall buildings of Denver. Uh, this was in the mid 1990s. Uh, here's an aerial view of the site. You can see it's really like a small city uh, at the time, it was isolated up here uh, on, uh, on this area. Today, uh, there are houses and, uh, and businesses all around here. And so uh, the story is how we uh, changed from uh, that site. Now, uh, in the 1950s and early 1960s, there were uh, many environmental problems at this site. Uh, 
Uh, we were just learning how to handle plutonium and there were three major fires. And if you work in a plutonium facility, uh, this is really your worst, worst nightmare. Um, and you could see we had uh, some, some fires that resulted in the release of plutonium from the facility into the environment. Uh, there had been some improper storage and illegal dumping. And the site was shut down uh, in a raid by the Environmental Protection Agency in 1989. And that really stranded a lot of plutonium in various different stages of processing. And the site was uh, fairly contaminated and it was named an EPA Superfund site. So this was a transition then in the US uh, from weapons production to environmental cleanup. And the site changed its name. This uh, RFETS is Rocky Flats Environmental Technology Site. So they were no longer producing weapons there. Now the idea was how do we clean it up? And uh, what was happening was that uh, in 1995, there was a lot of heavy rainfall and there was a lot of plutonium that was showing up at the, at the site boundary in the drainages. And so that created a lot of uh, uh, concern within the public. And the problem was that they were assuming that plutonium was soluble in ground and surface water because they were finding it uh, in, in the drainages. And yet all the modeling efforts, which used a KD approach, predicted that plutonium uh, wasn't moving. And so this created a lot of public mistrust and, and lack of confidence uh, with the concerned citizens and the anti-nuclear groups that lived in the area. So at that time, uh, the site created this actinide migration evaluation group to bring some independent experts to the site uh, to, to take a look at what was going on. And here's a photograph, uh, Professor Manchanda and some of the other seniors will recognize Professor Greg Chopin, uh, who was on that uh, committee with us, myself, uh, Dave Janicki, Leonard Lane, uh, who uh, these two guys are Los Alamos and US Department of Agriculture. So to start with, uh, there was a very large site characterization study uh, using high purity germanium detectors and geostatistics to generate maps like this. This is about 1500 uh, acres. Uh, this is the, the site uh, boundary here. And you could see these hot spots of plutonium around 1000 picocuries per gram. Uh, and the plutonium was really spread out over a fairly large area. And uh, this site right here where the hot spot was uh, was related to uh, an area where they stored um, machine oil. Uh, the the uh, the process of machining plutonium uh, changed to where it was done on a lathe with lathe coolant, and this was the lathe coolant. These drums got corroded; they leaked, they spilled plutonium into the soil, and then the plutonium got uh, dispersed around. So there's a fair amount of material there. And of course, to the right of this picture is where the downtown Denver is. And these arrows show uh, the wind direction. So the estimates from this type of study was that there was about 86 grams of plutonium uh, that had leaked out uh, into the soil. So the next piece was to assess what we knew about the science of plutonium and to whether or not it should be dissolved or not. And of course, we know that plutonium-4 in nature is the stable oxidation state. Uh, here's a typical solubility diagram from Volker Neck and J.L. Kim's group uh, from 2001. And you can see the solubility, both the experimental data and the uh, thermodynamic uh, fit to that shows that under natural pH conditions, pH six to nine, you should really have low plutonium concentrations of 10 to the minus 10 moles per liter or so. And so we know that plutonium solubility is controlled by the oxide uh, or the hydroxide, and it's extremely insoluble. There's also uh, what we now know is that concentrations in the environment above fallout levels are often linked to colloids and particulates. And there's two really nice studies here, Annie Kirsting, and this study, uh, Novikov and uh, Stepan Kolmakov, who was a speaker uh, in this symposium earlier this week. 
uh, beautiful uh, piece of work uh, showing the formation of colloids uh, in the environment. So also at Rocky Flats, we studied the soils and we found that the plutonium was in the upper, say 10 to 20 centimeters of soil and it didn't go uh, much deeper than that. It tended to get into the drainages and settle in these ponds. And so our view was that plutonium was likely an insoluble oxide uh, or a hydroxide and that any movement in the environment occurred through particulates uh, and colloids and that it was not dissolved. Well, that had to be proven to convince the uh, public. Uh, so samples were taken. Uh, and this is not easy work uh, to do when you're in uh, contaminated buildings or out in the field. So samples were taken from various different sources. And then uh, we chose to look at them using X-ray absorption spectroscopy. Uh, as Professor Manchanda mentioned, that was one of my great interests. And we used X-ray absorption spectroscopy because it's element specific. And here's an example of the uh, X-ray absorption edges uh, the L edges, the K edges, uh, and if you if you blow this edge up here, you can see uh, that the intensities and the edge shifts are very much dependent on the effective charge and therefore can be used to determine uh, oxidation states. So at about that time, uh, we had published uh, the Zane spectra of plutonium uh, in a variety of oxidation states, and we surmised that one could use the edge shifts the peak intensities and the overall shapes of these features to, to determine the oxidation state of plutonium in the Rocky Flats media. So here's an example, particularly over here on the right, uh, where we have our standards, plutonium three, this is plutonium four, five, and six, and then black and blue is, our, is a representative soil and concrete sample. And I'll just draw your attention here, you can see that the, uh, the edge shift and the peak height of these three, which is the plutonium four oxide and our, our soil and concrete sample, uh, all really uh, trace out very nicely that the zanes on actual environmental media were consistent with that tetravalent oxidation state. So really no one had, at this time, no one had really done spectroscopy on uh, soils before. Uh, so this was the first time that we were able to demonstrate at Rocky Flats that we had tetravalent plutonium. Uh, so then we thought we could go a little further and using X-ray absorption fine structure uh, on those samples, we could determine the structural characteristics. And so here, here's the XAFS data uh, in K space of uh, plutonium dioxide. And there's some uh, beautiful long range order here. Uh, what I'm going to do is jump to the curve fit to kind of illustrate how this works. On the right hand side is the FCC crystal structure. It's a fluorite crystal structure uh, with a plutonium central absorber. And then in red here are eight oxygens, the first shell of oxygens at uh, 2.33 angstroms. Followed by in gray are 12 uh, plutonium atoms at 3.81. 24 uh, oxygens it's sort of in pink here at 4.47. So these are radial distribution of these distances. And, and this is the XSAFS Fourier transform and curve fits uh, of a PuO2 sample. And you can see the first shell here, eight oxygens at 2.34 versus the crystal structure eight at 2.33, et cetera. And so this is how these curve fits work. Uh, just to illustrate that, and we had, of course, we had, were publishing these with my uh, good friend and colleague, Steve Conradson, uh, at that time. So then we were able to actually use this technique on plutonium in soil samples from the Rocky Flat site. And I'll just point out here, uh, one part per million uh, contamination of plutonium in a soil, it's about 60 nanocuries per gram. Uh, we were able to get some reasonably good XAFS data. And here is the fit, very similar to what I showed you before. And you can see that we get these same, uh, there's a little bit of uh, peak splitting that we get, but largely the same distances 
that we see in the pure oxide. And so this was demonstrating that what we had from a local structure probe was plutonium dioxide in the soil and in concrete samples, which I'm not showing, uh, that was really for the first time that the synchrotron work could demonstrate that we had tetravalent plutonium and that it was P2O2 in the soil. So this was a really big uh, advancement to be able to prove to the regulators that in fact, this is the chemical speciation of plutonium. And so they asked, well, wait a minute, what about the dissolved plutonium? And I would say that for years, there was a formalism that was used on the site that if plutonium in aqueous uh, media would pass through a 0.45 micron filter, they considered it to be dissolved. Uh, but of course we know um, that, well, that's an operational de definition, that's not really the correct uh, definition. So we used uh, tangential flow ultrafiltration or cross flow ultrafiltration. Again, this is well known to the separation scientists. Uh, and we were able to demonstrate, here's the 0.45 micron uh, cutoff of what would normally pass through a filter. And using various different uh, ultra filter sizes, we were able to show that the bulk of what passed through the filter was really at the colloidal dimensions of three kilodaltons up to about five microns. So there was a little bit of material that was lower than that. So really this filter passing plutonium isn't dissolved, it's really colloidal form. Uh, that doesn't surprise anybody today in, <laughs> To, in 2021, but in 1995 uh, to 2004 or so, this was kind of a big deal. Uh, so then what we had to do was some interesting model we, modeling. So now the question is if we have particulates and colloids that are moving and they're not in the subsurface, uh, how do they move on the surface? And so we used, this is a rainfall simulator where we simulated the intensities of different storms, uh, collected the runoff, measured the particle sizes and the, and the mass of soil that came off. And then we used some coupled, uh, an erosion model and a sediment transport model, that these were coupled. And it was able to show that in these various different drainages on the site, heavy rainfall would move particulates downstream uh, into these channels and this was uh, particulates would then get moved to where they were uh, detected. So what was interesting in hindsight was that this is physical transport of plutonium in the environment, not chemical transport. At the time, people were fixated on chemical transport models, things being dissolved and sorbing or desorbing to mineral phases. That's not what was happening at Rocky Flats. Of course, now we know this uh, it really is dominant uh, physical transport. Uh, you have plutonium that's insoluble, it forms colloidal materials, it attaches uh, secondary colloids to other minerals, and those move through wind dispersal or uh, water dispersal mechanisms. Um, again, pretty well established today, but at that time, that was a change in thinking. So that change in thinking uh, was used to help the site communicate with the concerned citizens that uh, what was really happening was surface plutonium was moving in uh, rain events and in wind events. And so that changed our, the philosophy of the cleanup to controlling surface soil erosion, both during remediation and uh, after remediation. And so now I'm gonna show you some pictures of how that kind of scientific understanding was used by the, um, the civil engineers to, to do the work. The first is they set up these large dome structures. They were HEPA filtered and inside those uh, structures, they did all their demolition. Um, and this was to avoid wind dispersal of any plutonium uh, that was uh, generated in dust. They also used um, water to control dust uh, on these concrete surfaces. And all that water was captured uh, in, in basins and then uh, cleaned up. 
and this was uh, how they were bringing some of those buildings down. And then they also completely recontoured the surface to control erosion. And uh, what you have here is that these used to be very hilly. This has been flattened out. This, I should say, is after the surface plutonium was removed. So they moved, um, removed a lot of surface soil, the you know, upper 20 centimeters of soil, uh, took that to a disposal site, recontoured the land. This is uh, coconut batting, uh, revegetated it, uh, armored the erosion channels uh, to protect from erosion. Uh, and uh, this was a picture of what used to be the main street or the, uh, that went through the site. Uh, and this was taken in uh, 2005. And so I'm going to now show you uh, an aerial photo. This was where we started in 1995. This was the site. This is the central avenue that goes through the site. Um, this was the high security area here. Uh, in 2005, after this uh, effort, uh, this was what the site looks like. You can see the coconut uh, matting uh, where they did revegetation. Uh, this was the site in 2011. You can see that vegetation has really taken hold. And the whole idea was to control uh, erosion. There's still a, a broad network of, of uh, surface water and groundwater monitoring at the site. There's been no detection of plutonium uh, uh, in all this time uh, from that monitoring site. Uh, this was the site of some of the, the buildings uh, in 2004, and here it is in 2010, where the buildings are gone and the vegetation has uh, come back. And then a final, a very important step was that the land uh, in this area was very valuable. And a lot of uh, new citizens were moving. There's a lot of new housing construction going on. And the idea was to prevent uh, construction on that site. So it was turned into a wildlife refuge to uh, ensure that uh, there would be no construction on the site. And uh, so at the end of this, uh, in 2006, it did cost a lot of money. It was about 7 billion US dollars to do that cleanup, uh, but it was a savings to the taxpayers of about 29 billion uh, based on the early estimates. Um, and this was the, the first change in approach in the United States to a science-based cleanup. And this started uh, the subsequent cleanup of many contaminated sites in the US. Um, and then I like uh, to show this for the students. I say it isn't finished until it's published. So uh, we wrote a nice uh, review on this work. Uh, in physics today. And so uh, students can go take a look at this if you're interested, September 2006, uh, to show how we use the scientific understanding uh, to guide the cleanup uh, of that site. Of course, this was done with the help of lots and lots of people uh, and funding from a variety of different sources. I do want to call out in particular uh, my good friend Steve Conradson. Uh, who is really the synchrotron expert uh, that was involved in helping us do the synchrotron work. So with that, I believe I have left enough time uh, to uh, answer some questions and I'll stop sharing and uh, open it up. Let me thank you once again, uh, Dr. Clack, for uh, bringing us some uh, chemistry input, physical inorganic chemistry input in this cleanup operation. And uh, in fact, I request uh, all the participants, they can raise the hand if they have a question. So let me start with the, my question. You know, uh, what I understood was that you have unambiguously shown that the contamination is caused by PuO2. 
that is the plutonium uh, dioxide. And uh, these are the collides actually. So the collides normally, if I understand, you know that their uh, rate of movement, it will depend upon the size of this collide. You know, the finer one may move faster as compared to the bigger one. So, so the from the original site, my first part is of the question is, what is the maximum distance you could see actually the signatures of these collides from the say, original center of this uh, source of these uh, uh, plutonium contamination sites? That is the first part of the question. The second one is that uh, these collides, if I understand, they normally are formed by interaction with the clay materials. So do we have uh, such collides or do you also have some uh, self-aggregation? That is uh, the plutonium dioxide itself, they can form the collides actually. These are two different questions. So can you please just- uh, Yes. Uh, uh, that, that, I been able to explain my question? Uh, no, uh, that very clear to me. So the, there are several uh, parts to the answer. First, uh, the, your comment about uh, colloid migration uh, and the, the you know size uh, and distance. A lot of that work is subsurface. So our, this was colloids in the surface water. And there were both kinds. In other words, there's the intrinsic colloid, which is the collo intrinsic colloid of plutonium that forms the uh, plutonium dioxide uh, nanoparticles, essentially. Um, but we don't think that that was uh, moving by itself, that that was always associated with minerals in what I would refer to as a secondary colloid. So the plutonium absorbs onto mineral surfaces and um, those move by surface water or uh, wind suspension and resedimentation processes. And you're absolutely right. The small particles move further distances is what we found. The large particles move uh, shorter distances. Um, in our studies, uh, you know, plutonium particles were found all the way to the fence line, which was the border of the facility. Uh, we didn't go outside of the facility to measure. Now, that was a uh, transport of uh, distances on the order of one mile from, but we know that it went further than that. Uh, and when you look at other studies from around the world, uh, there are cases where, you know, a transport's been seen uh, to much further distances. The uh, Annie Kirsting study was subsurface, that was four kilometers that they saw movement underground at the Nevada test site. And then that lovely study by Novikov, uh, I don't recall the distances, Hello. but I think that they're quite far. Yes. As Hello. many kilometers. Hello. Hello. Okay. Oh, okay. So I am. Uh, am I audible, Doctor Clark? Yes. Uh, I am given to understand there is some uh, issue related to the internet in the control room because I am, of course, out of the control room. Ah, okay. So, Oh, but uh, uh, let me just ask another question that uh, you have, uh, I don't know whether uh, intentionally avoided discussing the details of the cleanup operation. Is it, uh, can you give a bird's eye view of what are the cleaning operations like actually carried out? Of course, I don't know whether it is a sensitive part of the presentation. No, there are um, uh, many aspects to the cleanup itself. Uh, and in fact, I have a whole lecture, lecture just, I have a, a whole lecture on just the cleanup, uh, but there were a combination of uh, cleaning up metal surfaces was using um, syric ammonium nitrate uh, to oxidize plutonium. And, 
Then uh, for concrete cleanup, they used what's called hydrolazing, which was high pressure water to yeah, remove good. about uh, a centimeter of, uh, of concrete from the surface. Madam Poppy? No, but uh, people are not raising hand. I'm not able to see the raise hand. So hopefully, uh, people are are people not able to hear the answers. No, I think that the, the connection has been restored now, Doctor Class. Okay. Okay. So please go on. Yeah, so there was a combination of uh, high powered water, essentially sandblasting of concrete surfaces to remove the, the, you know, a few centimeters thickness of uh, concrete. Uh, and then ceric ammonium nitrate was used to decontaminate uh, like stainless steel surfaces like to oxidize the plutonium and extract it off. And then the soil itself was just uh, removed and actually put in uh, train cars and taken off site uh, to a disposal, a low level disposal area and in Utah. This, uh, what may be the uh, total size of the uh, size that is clay materials or that uh, all the uh, soil which you we have to deal with is it uh, i'm sure it will be thousands of tons yes it was about a uh, hundred tons of contaminated soil so actually not as much as you might think but about a hundred tons of soil that was removed okay uh, if anybody from the audience wants to ask the question please raise the hand Yes. Dr. Mahesh is raising his hand, sir. Yes. Yeah, please, please, Dr. Mahesh, please. Yes. Am I audible, sir? Yes. Yes. So that was a very nice lecture. So I have a small question. The humic substances are known to restrict the mobility of certain patient products as well as uh, heavy nuclei such as urinal things like that. Whether you notice such instances in your sites where you actually have some kind of humic substances where the plutonium oxides have been, uh, the mobility have been restricted, or even in the post case scenario where you said it, it has a very nice agricultural field where such humic substances have been thrown away to see some kind of plutonium restrictions. So uh, that's a really excellent question, and there, uh, there is in, indeed humic substances and organic uh, materials uh, that were on the site. Um, what our observation was, was that that was also part of the, what I would call the particle spectrum, meaning that because our transport mechanism was, you know, heavy rain, uh, we we have what we call our monsoon season. It's nothing like this monsoon season that you have, but it's a very heavy rain, and it moves a lot of soil, uh, you know, into these drainages, and um, and so that was really uh, the dominant transport vector. And so you're right. In addition to plutonium being adsorbed to mineral particles, also organic material. Uh, and humic substances, but when the heavy rains came, all of those materials were were moved as soil or sediment uh, as part of the transport. Thank you. That was very nice to hear. Even uh, we recently did some calculations on like cesium and strontium, where cesium mobility on humic substances are dominated dictated by water molecules as it's heavy, so it can be washed away. So that is nicely consistent with your uh, statement. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you, Mahesh. Okay, let me ask a few questions which we have received in the chat. The first one is, do you have any comment about the minor actinides, especially neptunium? So uh, that really wasn't an issue for us at the Rocky Flat site. Uh, so is the question just general mobility of neptunium and minor actinides or 
net mobility of Neptunium at Rocky Flats because we only really had the plutonium because it had been separated, you know, and converted into metal parts and those then uh, got out into the environment. There is another question in the chat box. I'm just reading out the question. The humic substances are known to restrict the mobility of uh, certain fission products such as strontium. Of course, I think they are uh, restricted if I understand all metal ions. So the question is whether you noted such instances in your sites for plutonium oxide. Yeah, I think I've answered that question actually. Yeah. Same thing. Mahesh yeah. only asked that question. Yeah. Okay, yes. okay, okay. Yeah. Now, the next uh, question is from Dr. Nitika Rawat. Uh, sir, typically for zanes and exaps, we need little higher concentrations. So, do we get such concentrations in environmental samples? So, I would say uh, with the modern uh, detectors, uh, you know, we, uh, that study was done with a 33 element germanium array detector in 2004. And that was one part per million plutonium. And so long collection times to get out, uh, you, you probably noticed, uh, I mean, it went by kind of quick, the K range that we collected was not as high as one would like to do. I think we got out to K of maybe 11, where we would tend to really like to go to 15 or 20 these days. So at that time, we were able to get good uh, zanes and exafs on one part per million plutonium in soil. So I think the key there is being patient, long signal averaging, uh, and using the state-of-the-art detectors. The ones that we use today at places like uh, Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Lab are 100 element uh, array detector. And so now, uh, and also we use uh, what we call micro-focusing. So we can focus down like a, you know, a two nanometer by two nanometer spot and start to image individual particles. And so it's, uh, I, it, it can be done uh with with the um with the right instrumentation and stanford is not the best synchrotron by any means uh <laughs> there are better ones out there but the question is uh, when you consider a site clean yeah, it's, it's not contaminated how they because radioactivity you always find it's difficult to 100 percent clean what are the parameters when you consider a site decontaminated? Okay, I'm not quite sure that I understood the question. There's some background conversation uh, going on. Well, you can repeat Nitika. Can you repeat yes. Nitika question. Yes, sir. So when you consider a site decontaminated, what are the parameters? Uh, how okay, that's yeah. So uh, it was on a slide. I went kind of quick. I was trying to watch the clock. So what we did is um, an excellent question, by the way. Uh, originally, the, uh, the, the concentration that we were trying to clean to was 650 picocuries per gram. And once we understood that plutonium was in the surface soil, uh, we negotiated a change to clean it down to 50 picocuries per gram because we felt that that was more important uh, since the true risk to the public was what was in the surface soil, right? And so it shouldn't be based on dose, but based on risk. Now, there were risk calculations that were done, uh, but 50 picocuries per gram was what was the cleanup standard for that central site. Uh, today, uh, there's a fence around that area and people, you know, humans aren't allowed in there. So we still don't want people going in, you know, just in case, right? Uh, Anyone else who has uh, any question to ask? I am finding one before the presenter. I think that may be Nitika's question, right? Anyone else? You can straight away, please go ahead and ask the question.
whether Ashwarya has any question? No, sir. Okay. I think uh, then uh, we will like to thank once again Dr. Clark for uh, staying awake till late night and uh, helping his friends in SESTAC to have a glimpse of uh, the science that he is he's doing, of course, many things, but he continues to educate and uh, inform the people all around, particularly his friends in India. And SESTAC is a good platform as I mentioned earlier, where he has uh, been kind enough to give his expertise to the youngsters as well as uh, all other participants. Excuse so, me, sir. Dr. Mitchell. Yes. Uh, sir, there are some more questions. Yes, please, please. Uh, hello? Yep. Yeah, I just want to know that uh, when you are doing this uh, site cleanup, you come across some specific minerals for them the plutonium option is like more as compared to the others am i audible yeah repeat please repeat yeah when you're doing this uh, site cleanup you must have traced so many minerals so can you tell me some specific minerals for which plutonium affinity or plutonium option is maximum so uh we didn't do that level of study uh, in terms of you know what the associated minerals were um but but there were certainly iron and manganese oxide minerals on the site uh, a lot of uh, silicon silicate uh, minerals uh, on the site um and while that's pretty popular today to look at the associated minerals uh, that's something that we actually didn't do we were really focused on <laughs> The plutonium edges itself. Anyone else have any question? Okay. Okay, then I think uh, this is the time once again to thank Dr. David Clark and he can take his rest for the night today and hope he will be available to the SESTAC whenever we organize this uh, in person. So let us hope we'll have occasion to meet soon. Thank you once again. And thank you all for uh, your engaging questions and the invitation. And I look forward to my next visit to India in person as well. So good night, uh, well, for thank me you. and good, have an enjoyable day. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Manchanda, for chairing such a nice session. Now we have come to the end of this session, and we'll be back at 14 30 hours for the panel discussion. And before we leave, I just request all the participants to switch on their cameras for the snapshot. Thank you, thank you all. See you again.